from this computer. There we go. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is go to File, Set Project, and we're going to pick a location where we want to save our directories. I'm just going to do it on my desktop. I'm just going to select the folder that I already created. So you can name it whatever you want, but um, preferably um, you would name it uh, the object that you're modeling and the version number that you currently are working on. So we're going to start with version one. So I'm just going to select that and I'm just going to say set. And you're going to get this window that pops up. Does not uh, contain project definitive file workspace. You can say create default workspace. Okay. And if we go to uh, file project window, we'll have our current project. We'll have our uh, location of the directory. And inside, we'll have a couple of different folders for where we save different um, elements. And when I say elements, I mean uh, renders, reference images, um, and our source images. So kind of like, yeah, our, which is our like reference images, sorry. So we have scenes. We're only really going to care about scenes, images, source images, and that's, that's about it. So just hit accept. And I know our scene is empty, but let's just save it anyway. So just go save as, and we're going to name it, um, like I mentioned before, uh, name, version, increment, and extension. So we're going to go uh, I'm going to go uh, dumbbell underscore version, or sorry, uh, what type of um, operation you're doing. So we'll be modeling. So we'll just put model underscore version 001, and we'll do dot 001 for our increment, and then we'll just do an MB as we are just going to save an MB file. Preferably when you start working in production, um, ASCII files are good um, because ASCII files can be edited. So let's say your computer crashes or your program crashes halfway through saving a file. Uh, with a Maya ASCII file, you can open it up in a text editor and edit certain things and possibly able to retrieve some of your work. But for today, we'll just use a uh, Maya binary file. And as you can see, because we set our workspace and set our directory, it's automatically saving in our scenes directory. Okay. So now that we did that, I want you to Hit spacebar so we can see our four panels. And if you don't see it like this, you can you can click on the side here on this little button, and you'll get your four windows. So the images that we have, we have a side view and and a front view. Let's say so front for in in Maya. Let's just create a cube. So front in Maya is always going to be TZ, so in the Z direction. That's always going to be your front view. Sometimes when I start modeling, I'll goof and I'll do X, but then when you go into your front view, it'll actually be your side view. So just keep that in, in the back of your uh, mind when you're working, that your front view is always your TZ, which is your translate Z. So um, we'll go. We'll hit spacebar to maximize our front view, and I'll be showing some of this window here today, and some of these options here 
as we're working. So I want you to go to view and you're gonna select camera and you're gonna hit control A and this brings up your attribute editor. I spoke about this um, in a little bit of detail last time, not too much, but this is pretty much all your camera settings for the front view. You can change the angle of view, your focal length, your camera scale, your near clipping plane, your far clipping plane. I'll explain what these are um, in a little bit once we start going. And But for now, all you need to do is go all the way down to the environment option. And you're going to click on the create button. And it'll take you to another window option, sorry. So here, you'll see a couple of things, but the one thing that you will want to mainly focus on is this image name. So you can see here, you can input a name or technically what we would put in is a directory path. To do that, we're gonna click on the little folder icon and you see how it takes us to our source directory. So what I'm gonna do real quick here is I'm just gonna go to my dumbbell directory and I have my two, two images here. I'm gonna just cut them out and I'm gonna open up my source directory and I'm gonna save my images in here. Okay, I don't know why I labeled both of them. <laughs> I labeled both of them side view for some reason. So let's just right click on this one and just rename it. Oops. Rename this once. Okay. So now if we come in, when we're back in Maya, we still had that window open and we can see our two files. So we're in our front view, so we're just gonna open our front image and just hit open. And automatically, we see our image in the front viewport. So we're pretty much done with the front viewport. So if you hit spacebar, oops, sorry, just that is. So close this window and click on the screen and hit spacebar. And now in our perspective view, we can actually see our image plane from the front view. So now what we're gonna do is, we're gonna go in our side view, we're gonna just click in the window and hit space bar, and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna go to view, select camera, control A for to bring up our attribute editor, and control A is the default command for your attribute editor. And we're already down here at our environment tab and we're just gonna hit create. And we're gonna do the same thing. Under image name, we're gonna click on the little folder and, oh, sorry, I just, I guess it took a while to load up. We're gonna load up our side. There's nothing crazy uh, with our side view. It's just, it's pretty flat, but as we can see, we can tell a little bit, we, we see the depth, like how much we have to extrude, okay? So if we hit space bar and we go into our perspective, now we have two nice images of our object that we're gonna model. So what I like to do is I like to select the front view image plane and I just like to slide it back a bit. And then I like to take the side and I'll slide it over. So as we're modeling at the origin, we can model to this and we can use this as our gauge for our scale. So as you can see here, 
the images come with a rough scale for our scene. So technically, what we should be doing is we should be making um, what we could do is possibly make a rough cube from this distance to this distance that is about five five inches and we can scale the images until it it matches so and that way we know our dumbbell that we're modeling is the same size uh, in our Maya scene that it would be in real world. So the scales would match. So to do that, we'll just go back in our front view. And I remember I showed you in um, the first class, we have something called measuring tools. So to do that, we go to create. And at the bottom here, we have measuring tools. So if we tear off the window, we can just have it loading here. And we can click on our little distance tool. And we can roughly, what we can do is, since we don't have an object to snap the locator to, we can just snap it to the grid. So if we hit X, it activates our snap to grid. And if we just click, our locator gets created on this side. And if we go over here and click X to, to click, and then we're just going to click on that point. And now we have a distance of seven. But again, that is seven centimeters. So you can actually, let's just hit Q to get out of the measuring tool. So you can see how small this is. Tech, this is five inches, and this is only seven centimeters across. Remember, each square is a one by one by one centimeter cube. So one centimeter, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So to scale that up, what we can do now is, well, first we have to know what's five inches in centimeters. Does anybody? Anybody 12. do some math for me? 12. 12? All right. I don't need Google. Perfect. I see someone uh, who's yawning. 12.7. Uh, how much? 12.7. Oh, okay. 12.7. That's okay. Hey, Zoran, stop, ya stop yawning, huh? I just came home from work. But I'll oh, also. sorry. Sorry. Okay. I know, I know, work, work and uh, studying is, is hard. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to select our two locators and our little distance um, tool here. And we're going to hold, or we're going to hit control G. And that groups all those three, ele three elements into one. Okay. And now what we can do is, since all three are in one and we select the group, we can move everything together. And we can also scale everything together. And you can see as we scale, our value goes up. So what we can do here is, um, I forgot actually to put the image planes in the group. So all you need to do for that is just select one image plane, hit shift, and then just, and then middle mouse, drag them both into the group. Okay, so now as we scale this, the, the scene will scale up too. So if we go all the way up to 12.7, there we go. So 12.706. So, and you can see on the side in our channel box that we scaled it from one to 1.815. So technically we probably go 
that's that's 12.6 so maybe 1.81 1.815. Uh, let's change that 5 to a 3. Okay, to a 4 to 4, 5. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. 1.815 is okay. Don't worry about it. You're fine. We're not, it's not like we're working in um, AutoCAD or any other kind of mechanical software where we have to be super precise. This is VFX after all. It's always, the, the theme is how can we cheat and how can we cheat uh, effectively? So it doesn't matter if it's not 100%. And you can see our measurements is not even 100%. So if we select this locator and just move it over until it like touches that red line, and move this one over till it touches the red line. You can see we're still not on 100%. So we can just still go up a little bit, 12.7 there, that's fine. So now we go into our perspective view. So our scene is scaled up. The distance between the, the two dumbbells is 12.7 or five inches. So, Technically, when we make this dumbbell now, it should be in real world scale. And we can always double check it after with the other measurements that we have here. But for now, let's just uh, work with what we got. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just select my little distance tool and I'm just gonna hit Control H to hide it. And I'm just going to go to File and Increment and Save. So as you can see at the bottom, it's dumbbell underscore model underscore version one dot zero zero two now. So as we save increments, this value will change and not our version number. I know when I first started uh, school, I would be version one, two, three, four, twenty, thirty, forty, ninety nine, 30, 40, 99, 150, and then eventually I got bored and I'd be like final, 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 final. So let's, let's not go that far. Okay. So let's start with this model. So it's going to be easy to start with. All I have to do is we can start with a cube. Or sorry, yeah, a cube. Cube or cylinder? Um, let's try. Let's try a cylinder. Okay. I'm going to take that cylinder, and we're just going to rotate it 90 degrees in Z. So you can roughly just match it, and then here in RZ, you can change it to 70. And again, if I say TX TY, I mean translate. If I see, if I say RX, I meant, I mean rotate X. So, okay. So now we have our dumbbell. So how many sides do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we're gonna go to our cylinder and we're gonna take our subdivision and we're gonna take it down. There you go. So it's not oriented correctly. So we're just gonna rotate in Y, another negative 90 or 90, it doesn't matter. And there you go, you're done, class over. I'm just joking. So what we can do here is we can just go to our Ta, ta, ta. So remember, spacebar, left click in the middle where it says Maya, and you can navigate to all your cameras. Okay? Or you can just hit spacebar and then just go to uh, your side view. But what's going on here? I see my image plane, but I don't see my geometry. Does anybody know why? It's behind. There you go. So what do we have to do? So
So obviously this side camera is over here. So we just have to move the, the side image plane to the other side. So now when we go back to our side view, we can see our geometry. So now I'm just gonna scale it up. And you can see it could be the image is stretched a little bit, but it doesn't fit perfectly, that's fine. If you wanna be a perfectionist, you can probably stretch it in the other angles if you want. But for me, I'm just gonna leave it um, uniform. I'm gonna go back to perspective, and there it is. Wow, that's a pretty big dumbbell. So let's go to our front view now. And this is a bad habit of mine. You can see I went to my four windows, and now each window is perspective. I have a bad habit of doing that. So sometimes I'll be here working in the side view, and then I'll hit spacebar and I'll go to perspective instead of just hitting spacebar and actually going to my perspective view. Either way you guys like to work is fine. It's just, it's personal preference. So I'm gonna go to my front view now. I'm gonna move my dumbbell over and I'm going to scale this down a little bit. And as you can see, this dumbbell is not really fully front view. It's got perspective to it. It's not fully orthographic. So that's okay. We can, we can make do. So as you can see, we're pretty close with our images from our side image to our front image. We're, we're only off a little bit. My Photoshop's, I guess I didn't double check my Photoshop as well as I should have, but um, that's okay. And I'll do a separate video on how to take orthographic images and align them in Photoshop. So when you bring them into Maya, they are all oriented properly and level because sometimes people get lazy and they'll just bring in different images and they'll move them up and down to kind of line them up so they're aligned in the different views. But if you do your work properly in Photoshop, all you have to do is bring in your images and leave them where they are and they should be aligned in, in the different sections all by themselves. You don't have to worry about fudging things. Okay, so if we hit five for shade of view, you can see that our scale is pretty good and the distance in between is pretty good. So now, what do we have to do? Right. What's, what, what do you think our first command is going to be? Anybody? Extrude. Extrude, yes. So what we can do here, if you go into our side view, whoops. So what you can do is you can actually just go into uh, component mode faces by right clicking and just going to face, or you can go up here and just turn this on. So you're like, sir, if I drag select everything, if I drag select everything, I selected everything. But if you hold down control and just drag select the inside, you'll actually deselect the inside and only have the side selected. So now what we can do is hit shift, right click, and we have some of our uh, most important modeling tools all here. So that's shift, right click, and we can go to extrude. So you can see that we have our special gimbal, the, our extrude gimbal. So we can either push out with TZ, right? And you'll see local translate T 
TZ is 1.1, uh, you'll get your value here. Or if you undo that, you can click and drag on thickness and you can extrude. Sometimes, I don't know if there's a real difference per se from doing one and the other. I don't know, I don't know why it's like that, but it is. So we're just gonna go off the one side because the dumbbell is probably, it's probably slanted away from the camera. So this end is further away and this end is probably closer or maybe the focal length is different. If you, um, if you get an image where it's kind of a front view, but you know it's, it's either angled upwards or there's perspective to it, what you can do is you can create your own camera and assign an image plane to it and kind of align it yourself. And you know what, maybe I'll show you that at the end or I'll make it a separate video just so we don't go too off topic for today. So I extruded outwards in both directions evenly. And if I go to my perspective view, you'll see it. So now, oops. Um, let's see, if I hit scale, See, it's gonna scale it back down. Uh, I See, I made more work for myself because I extruded outwards to match, to match the extrude depth, but then I didn't scale it down to get the right scale for when it's extruded out. So what I should have done, let's say before, before I extrude outwards, I just hit the extrude option and I go to my side view and just forget about the, um, the poly extrude command and just hit R for scale. And I can scale it down. But if you hit four to go into wireframe mode, now we can just scale this down and match the actual extrude uh, depth. So let's just roughly guesstimate around here. Let's say like that. I know it's not 100%, but no image you, you're going to use from photos is going to be perfect unless it's like an architectural drawing or a blueprint drawing. So, so there we go. <laughs> we extrude. We scaled it in, but you see it's awkward now. But that's okay, because now we can go back to our front view, and instead of using the extrude option, we can just use the scale in Y, and we can just push it out. And we just kinda, just kinda match it. So there you go. So we match the side view. And we roughly got the proper depth on the extrude from the side view, or sorry, the front view. So there you go, you created one little extrusion. Let's see, what else? We can, we can also create this little extrusion for where the number bevel is gonna sit. So, we're going, we can do that now. So we can just select one of these faces. We don't have to follow the drawing or anything like that. We can just follow our own sense from just looking at the image. So if we select this one face, shift, right click, extrude. Sorry, just, let's, oh, just move that out of the way. And, the next option I like to use is offset. So you can use scale, but if you use scale, it actually pushes, it pushes in just like 
it pushed in when we use scale to make this smaller. So when I did that, I lost my gimbal now on my extrude, but I'm still in the extrude option. So if I hit T, you can get it back. Does it, can everybody try that? So just hit W and then, and then you can, you can do stuff, but if you undo it and then hit T, you get your manipulate your gimbal back for the extrude and you get your options back. And now we can kind of just use the offset tool to kind of guesstimate how thick we want that lift to be. So I'm going to go with 0.8. And as you can see, the top lip is a little thicker than the side. So here you can just, you can just scale it in the T, TX a little bit to kind of offset that. So now we, we have our, we have our first extrusion. So we just hit G now to repeat the command, to repeat the extrude command. And now we can just push in a little bit. And now we have that indent for our numbers. Just hit Q to exit the tool. And there you go. So if you want to marvel in your model, you're going to hit three to see your nicely, your nice model in sub D mode. And it's going to look like uh, a cylinder. So how can we, what, what option or what command do we need to use to reinforce our edges? So when we subdivide, we get um, nice, bevels like we do in our real object. Insert loop edge. We can use insert edge loop. Yes. Or we can use bevel. So let's uh, let's try bevel first and we'll see how well that works out for us. And if not, we might have to manually go in and insert edge loops. Okay. So sometimes now that you have your one object done, you're like, ugh, you're trying to model, but the image plane is in your way. You're like, oh, come on, what am I supposed to do? So A, you can use this little option here. I showed it to you, which was the isolate select option. So Anything you have selected, it will hide the opposite. Or what you can do is you can go up to your perspective pane window up here. You see where it says show. And if you click on it, you can turn on and off different things that you can create in your scene. So for Maya, you can, or sorry, for the image planes, we can just come down to image planes and turn it off. And the command for that was Alt-4. There you go, you can just toggle that on and off. Okay. And by the way, um, does anybody know what this window up here is called? Where you have all these little tabs, you have MASH, Bifrost, Custom, effects. Does anybody know what that's called? Shelf. Your shelf, yes. So in your shelf, you have different things. And if you go, you have a modeling shelf. And you know what? I don't like having such a, I don't need all of these things. So when I'm modeling, I go to my custom shelf and then I can add my tools that I use regularly that but all the other ones I don't need. So to let's say you wanna add a command from your windows to your shelf. How do we do that? Easy. So let's say we wanna 
bevel. So we go over bevel and we hold control and shift and then left click. And you can see it didn't actually activate the command, but it added it to the window or to the shelf, to the custom shelf. So now you can, you can make more shelves or I just use my custom shelf and I put all my little modeling tools or commands that I use all the time here. Okay. So now if you click on it here, you have your bevel options. And you can see that once we did hit it, it actually beveled our dumbbell. But with the standard bevel, you sometimes get errors like this. One, two, three, four, five sides. And that's called the end gun. Anything with more, uh, more than uh, four sides is an end gun or manifold geometry. You don't want this. Maya does not like to render this kind of geometry nicely uh, too much of the time. So we want to stick to quads. So four-sided polygons or triangles, three-sided polygons. So to fix this, what we can do is we can go to segments and we can change it to two. And two or let's see if we can do, yeah, so two. Two is the highest I would ever go on a bevel because any more than that and you start to get weird uh, divisions. See, if we do three, we still end up with an end gone. So that means you'd have to go all the way to four. And then you have like a little star. And honestly, like a subdivision level of four and a subdivision level of two with a smooth, with a sub D is just as good. Okay. So you could leave it like this, but what I like to do is, let's say you want to undo the bevel. There's a couple ways to do it. You can keep doing undo until the bevel is gone, or let's say you hit bevel and you don't want this anymore. You see how it, in your construction history, it says bevel, uh, poly bevel. If we click on this and copy the name, so control C to copy the name, and then we go up here. And if you don't see this window, some the default look is like this. You get this little crosshair with the X, Y, Z. And sometimes it's minimized. So if you maximize it and then click and hold, you get different options. Mostly for what we do in Maya, we just work with rename and select by name. So if we go to select by name and enter the poly, the poly bevel one and hit enter, it actually selects the poly bevel in history. And then if you hit delete, it deletes it it's not here anymore. So there's a couple ways you can, uh, you can undo until the command is gone, or you can just select the name, paste it in your select by name option, hit enter to select the command, and then hit delete. And you can see that extrude I did earlier is gone now. Okay, I want to undo that so I can bring that back. So now I undid that bevel because if we look at our sides here, I have triangles for no reason. I don't need triangles here. So what I can do here is I can select, I can go into, uh, I can right click, go component edge mode, and I can select these these two and these two. 
and then hit Control Delete. And I'm left with two polygons. So instead of instead of three trying uh, six triangles, I'm just left with two uh, four sided polygons. I'm going to do the same on the other side. And this is just good. Um, it's just a good habit to get into to minimize as many triangles you have in your scene. I'm currently working on a Netflix show. It's called Grimm. It's based on the tales of Grimm, like um, Red, Riding, Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel and so on. And we're modeling the characters. And sometimes to create a certain look, I add a lot of edge loops, but then I just quickly finish them into a triangle. And my director's like, oh, come on, Phil, we don't need triangles. I'm like, sir, it's not deforming. It's just gonna sit there. He's like, I know, but just get rid of them. So I'm like, you're at the mercy of your boss. So it is what it is. Usually in VFX, um, I'll tell you if like, if you can take an edge loop and hide the triangle where no one's going to see it, that's perfect. That's, that's the best way to do something. You don't need to add more geometry just so you have quads. If you can just quickly bring it into a triangle and not worry about it. So now I added my bevel and I didn't get I didn't get my command pop up, so I just hit T and it just brought up my command. I'm just gonna change the segments to two. And there you go. So it's still quads. I just don't have those extra edge loops going across here anymore. And even here on the flat surface, sometimes we know that this is 100% flat, but sometimes when you're modeling something like a spaceship, and you're extruding on different angles, you, it might not be as flat as you think. And if you have three edges together like this, it sometimes will create a dark line in your render. Okay? For this, it shouldn't matter, but to, to get rid of this, all we have to do is just take these three, shift, right click, Merge, merge vertice to center. And we can go to the other end, click our three vertices and hit G for recent command. So those three edges are all of a sudden just one. And you can see, I have a triangle here and I don't need to. If I select this edge and this and do a control delete, now I have a quad that matches these down here. So everything looks nice and clean. So, oh. Philip? Yes. A question on behalf of Maimuna. Yeah? He's just wanting clarification around bevels and whether they're, like, are they stylistically necessary or are they structurally necessary to build in with a bevel like you just did, even though uh, you don't see a bevel? Well, we do see the bevel because when we look on the edge, it's not, it's not as, um, when you render it, you won't see it in the viewport, but you will see it in the render. It's, you, you, you give it a nice curved edge instead of a nice sharp edge because nothing in the real, the real, I always have a trouble with that word, in the real world, is something so razor sharp like when we create things in CG. So when you look at like this dumbbell picture here, you can see there's a bevel there. And it to also pass off that this object is real when we render it, it catches a highlight and it gives it like a nice soft highlight. So if we were to go here 
And I'll show you how to do this in a bit, but don't worry. I'm just going to put a different material on it. I'm going to put a blin. Oops. And you can see the bevel is catching a, a highlight. So compare this to if we had just a, a cube. Oops, I'm still isolated. I'll select these two, I'll isolate it. So let me put the same material on it. You see what I mean? These two have the same material. And yet we get a nice highlight around the edge. So bevels are a uh, not so much stylistic, but they are structural. Okay. As in, I, I do see that. That was a clear yeah. example having the two. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. So it's just and yeah, in CG you can make something, and I think there are show, shows around where when you keep something very low poly and very uh, rigid and sharp, there is a style to it. But for the most part, you do want to, you don't, you don't have to do it with a bevel. You can, you can do it with adding an edge loop. So on the cube, so let's just uh, right click, insert edge. I'm just gonna insert an edge really close to the corner and another one really close to the corner. And you can see, even though I added those two edges, we don't really see anything. But if we smooth it, we do see something. But what a bevel does is, when it adds the supporting edges, it takes this, uh, sorry, it's hard to orient sometimes. But when you select the, the corner edge, it actually, it, it bevels it. So it brings it in and down. So it kind of rounds that edge a little bit. You can do this yourself manually. And this is what we used to do back in the day. I'm talking about early 2000s when there was no bevel command. So we would have to um, reinforce our own edges. And this is how we would do it. And you can see I'm not even in uh, sub D mode. But even with me just pushing in that edge a little bit, it catches some highlight. Okay. Thanks very much. No worries. Clear as a bell. Um, so next. So the next thought, so we're done with our little dumbbell on the side or our weight on the end. So now we can create our grip, I guess. So for the grip, again, it's very simple. It's just a cylinder. And don't mind the earthquake upstairs. It's just my kids jumping. They think the house is a basketball court for some reason. Um, and you can... I just noticed this, but do you see this this red line here? It looks like that's actually the center of the object. And look where the center of the object is, and look where the center of my Maya is. So let's just correct that right now. I'm going to take my little dumbbell I made, my poly cylinder. I'm going to throw it in the group with everything else. And... I will go to my front view and I will just move everything over until that red line is in the center. I don't know how I missed that, but it's okay. There we go. So now we can model this little grip. So again, create polygon cylinder. We're going to rotate it in RZ, 90 degrees. And one quick thing is, cylinders always come in with a subdivision of 20, and you can work with 20, that's fine. But in the end, when we do render, we do subdivide the object. So let's say like when you hit 
three on the keyboard. When you do it here, it doesn't look like it adds more geometry, but when you render it, what the renderer actually does is it creates a smooth node like this. So it actually adds more geometry. So if we were to do this to a cylinder, and if we smoothed it, okay, first of all, don't mind um, how screwed up it gets on the ends, but just pay attention. It adds way more um, edge loops around the sides. So the one thing I like to tell people is, for an object that is going to be medium to uh, in front of screen, I usually use 12 and higher. So I'll go to 12, maybe 14. Uh, hold on. I want to get, no, 16. I do 16 because if I, if I do 14, I don't get a perfect mirrorable object, mirrorable cylinder. So if I go to six, or sorry, uh, 14. So if I go to 16 and I select faces, see, it's a perfect mirror. But if it was any less, it would get awkward to, to kind of mirror the object. So, but for me, like I try to use as low geometry as I can. So I'll use 12 and sometimes, let's say you're making a hole in somebody's belt buckle um, or like, yeah, the little notch in a belt, I will go to even like four or eight. I don't need, I don't need that much. Even four, when you smooth it, it turns into a sphere. Uh, or um, the cube turns into a sphere, or a cylinder, sorry. So you're fine. But for this, we'll just do 12. We'll go into our front view. We will scale up our cylinder until it matches with our diameter of our image. There you go. And then here you could either scale it out in Y all the way, or you can just select vertices and move it over. So I'll just select the vertices and I'll move it over until it's just intersecting the ends of the dumbbell. And I'll drag select all the vertices here and I'll hit X and I'll just snap them to the center. So I snap them to the center. So when I group my two geos here, let's say I select this, and let's say you wanna take an object outside of a group. You just hit Shift P. So Control P, oops, so control P to, no, or is it just P or shift? Okay, I don't have that command graph. But, sorry, you can just middle mouse drag to put something in a group, or you can middle mouse drag to take it out of the group, or you can hit uh, shift P, uh, sorry, shift P to take it out of the group. So either or, I usually just, manually just drag them out. Okay, so we're gonna select our two cylinders, our, our two objects, and we're gonna group them. And as you can see, our gimbal now is at the center of the origin. So why did I snap the ends of these vertices to the center? Anybody? So it's orientation a, for mirroring? Yes. So this is easier for us to just hit Control D to duplicate. And then under the scale X, we just go negative one. And there you go. 
Obviously, we're not done, but I just want to show you that. So I'm just going to I'm going to delete the mirrored group. And but the one thing when you're mirroring objects and joining them, you don't want faces on the inside. So what we'll do is I'll just drag select everything, control, drag what I want to keep. So it only selects the geometry that I want to delete and I'll just hit delete. And I'll hit delete on the inside too. So select everything, control select what I want to keep and delete everything else. So here, so we just have like an open cylinder right now. If we go back to our front view, we can see where we need to add an edge loop so we can create this taper. Okay, so we will go to object mode, shift, right click, and you can either insert edge loop or use your multi-tool. So I'm just gonna use a multi-tool and I will hit control and my insert edge loop pops up. I'm gonna add an edge loop here. I'm gonna add an edge loop here and here. So I added an edge loop at my highest point on the left side, at my highest point on the right side, and at my lowest point in, in between. Because now if I double click and select that edge loop and hit R for scale, and I just scale it from the center, which is here, it'll bring it down, and there you go. If I didn't have these here, this edge loop and this edge loop, it would basically do this. It would just, it would just, the whole thing would taper in. So here, just like we did before, if you hit, if you hit three to see the subdivision, the outer edge loops and even the inner one do not hold. You can see how sharp the edge is on the actual uh, image. So we'll select all three edge loops and we will hit bevel. And you can see the bevels are really far apart. You can hit T, whoops. You can hit T to bring up the command or if you've already uh, done some other stuff and T for some reason doesn't work, what you can do is uh, go to the bevel command in your history, click on it, and you have the same options here. You have the fraction and the segments. So when we click on the fraction and middle mouse drag on the screen, we can control how far those edge loops are from each other. So we'll just do, let's, let's just leave it at um, two and add a segment of two. And now if we subdivide, we keep our shape and it looks like our dumbbell. So let me just add that shiny material again so we can see what it looks like. There you go. And it doesn't really matter that it intersects here, but if, if that does bother you, um, what we can do is go into edge component mode, double click that edge, take it out until just before it intersects, and we can extrude, uh, shift right click, extrude edge, and then just hit R for scale, and we can just scale in. And then when we smooth it, we get this rounded edge, but that's too round. So again, we're gonna select this outer edge and we're gonna bevel it. We're gonna go to our bevel history. We're gonna change it from 0.5 to maybe 0.1 because it's, it's gonna be really sharp. And we're gonna add a segment of two. And then when we subdivide it, you don't get that nasty, you don't get that nasty intersection look. So you will catch a highlight. 
So, and um, does anybody know what ambient occlusion is? No? Okay. So if we, Maya comes with some, a couple of nice buttons. This button here with a, a sphere and a plane under it, and it kind of has like these like shadow lines. If you click on it, you can see that it adds like some shadows to a lot of the creases where like there's corners. So if I toggle that, you can see the difference. So basically that mimics uh, ambient occlusion render. So basically like a, like a contact pass. So basically what ambient occlusion is, wherever two objects meet, render a little shadow around it. It's kind of like everything in life. Like when one object, when one object is on top of another, there's always like, whoa, oh, let's balance his coffee. There's always like a little dark spot, dark spot underneath it. Any anytime something is touching something else, you're always going to have a little darkness around there. Okay, so we have our dumbbell, we have our half grip, and you know what? I think it's time to celebrate with a save. So we're going to go file. Increment and save. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is just delete history. So we're gonna to go to edit, delete by type, history, select our group, and duplicate our group. So control D, and we're gonna mirror in X, and we have our sim. We duplicated our symmetry, or we uh, we mirrored our object. Uh, let's read the comment. Yes, resin. You can you can reduce the the opacity of the image plane so you can see through it. And to do that, what you can do is. You can select the image, the image plane, sorry, and control A for attribute editor. And you can see right here, you have color gain, color offset, and alpha gain. So alpha gain is what's gonna control the visibility or the opacity of your object. If we move the slider down, it makes it transparent all the way to zero. Okay, if you guys are interested in using that, you can. I still kind of find this distracting sometimes, but it's up to you. Another thing you can do is the option right at the top where it says display. It says look through camera or in all views. If you select look through camera, basically the image plane will disappear from all other cameras except where it was attached to which would be the side. If we turn it back to all views, now the image plane will show up in all the views. All right. So we see that we mirrored our objects, but as you can see, we have four objects. So nothing is actually combined. Sometimes I like to do it this way where I will mirror the object manually and uh, using scale X or scale Z, whichever. And then what I would do would, would be select the two halves. I would go to mesh, combine, and I would combine the objects. And as you can see in your outliner, the two cylinders, which don't have the geometry uh, logo anymore, uh, have turned into group images or group logos. And now we have one uh, piece of geometry and the other ones just have transform history. And remember, if you delete these, it's gonna delete that object. So the best way to 
once you combine an object or combine two objects is select that object and edit delete history and it'll delete those transform history nodes but one thing you will notice when you just combine two objects if you go into component mode and select all the faces or all the vertices and move the object it's not actually connected and the way we have to connect it is if we go into our vertice component mode and we manually merge all these vertices. Because as you can see, when you drag select over this one vertice, it's actually showing two vertices. The one vertice from one half and the other vertice from the other half. We can fix this two ways we can use the edit or, or the edit mesh merge to center and that combines the two vertices to one or you can select those the next two vertices and you could either use the merge to center or just the merge so this is where the merge comes into its own so if we select all these vertices you can see, instead of having 12, or technically it was supposed to be 24 because it's 12 on each side, we have 22 because we merged two of them already. So if we used, if we used Edit Mesh Merge to Center, it actually merges everything to the center. But if we use the Merge, just the regular Merge option box, or just just hit merge, ah, oh, sorry. Just hit merge, what? Uh, I'll tell you why it's doing that, okay. So we have to go to merge option box. So you can see the threshold here. If I reset it, technically right now it's set to one. If I reset it, it's 0 0.01. So if I hit apply now, you see how it didn't merge to the center? And if I set the threshold to one, it'll merge everything to the center. And this is the power of just the merge vertice tool. You can set the threshold of how far the vertices have to be from each other before it will glue those two vertices together. So if we, if we set the threshold low enough to point, to point zero 0.01 or point zero zero 0.001, and hit apply, it actually merged everything. And you can see here, we only have 12 vertices now. So instead of going through one by selecting the two, one by one, going around, selecting two, two, and then merging them to center, you can select all of them and merge with a low enough threshold. So let's say this vertice and this vertice don't merge together but the two vertices that were on top of each other will merge. So if we hit three to see our subdivide, you can see that it's nice and merged. And if we double click, you see how it doesn't select just the one half anymore, it selects both halves. There's another way to do this, and I'll show you that right now. I'm just gonna delete half of it I'm just going to select this object. The pivot always has to be in the center where you want to mirror from. And that's the name of the command, mirror. So under mesh, you have a mirror command. You can hit mirror and you can see, well, what happened? Why didn't it mirror? Well, you can see here, the axis that the default mirror option uses is wrong. It's on Z but we want to mirror on X. So if we just select this and switch it from Z to X, everything disappeared because everything is broken. Because obviously Autodesk cannot create software that works properly. So what we have to do here is change the, the cut geometry to off. Okay, 
I don't know why that option is on by default, but it's just the way Autodesk works. For some reason, they think that you want that on. So basically, you can see the poly mirror is just a combination of different um, commands into one. So we have, so basically, it's basically a merge border, and you have the same thing. You have a merge threshold. And you can always play with it here. And if you ever lose this window, let's say by hitting Q or something, you always have it in your construction history. All right. So now that we have this done, we can edit, delete by type history. And I'm actually going to add this to my custom toolbar. So if we hold Control Shift and click on history, now it's here. And we can just delete our history. So now we basically successfully completed our dumbbell. Um, next class, I'm going to assign a modeling um, assignment on top of this. And then in next class, we will learn Substance Painter. So where we can texture our object. Okay. So, sorry, Phil, could you, how did, how did you fix the mirror thing? Um, oh, so when you go mirror option box, it's this stupid cut geo. It's on by default. Just turn it off. Okay. Thank you. No worries. And let's say you want to assign some basic shaders in, in Maya. Okay, what we can do is we can go to the hypershade. There's a couple ways to go to the hypershade. We can go to Windows, Rendering, Rendering Editors, and Hypershade. And you can see the little logo. It looks like a little uh, ball with a little uh, circle inside of it. So if we click on that, it takes a while. And here is our hypershade. So this is where you can apply different materials to your objects. And if you look at your window up here, you can see your hypershade is actually right here. Excuse me. So, whoops. So you can see we have our little blend shader that we created earlier. So we can see the highlights. So it gives it that little that metal look, it adds specular. So what we can do here is we can go to, we have our standard um, Arnold shaders, which you will be using um, to in texturing. Or you, you also have our like little default Maya shaders. For now, just for viewing in, in our viewport here, I'll just use just the standard shaders. So I'm going to just select the handle and I'm just going to pick and assign a blend again. So you can see we have two. So this blend one is assigned to our little weights on the end. If you double click it, you will get the attribute editor for it. Or if you select and hit attribute editor, you will get the same thing. And you have a couple options here. You can play with transparency. You can play with the ambient color. Ambient color means um, it doesn't need lights to, to light up the object. It's just, it's self lit. But what we want to play with is the color tab here. So we're going to change this. We're going to make it a little darker, not black, because it's just too much. You want to make it, you want to make it off gray a little bit. And you can see when I changed the blend one, it actually changed it on everything, even though I created another blend. So how, do, how can we assign this shader to this object? Well, there's a couple ways. You can select the object. 
you can hover over the material and right click and you can go assign material to selection. Or you can select the material, middle mouse drag it on top of the object. Just to show you that work, I'm just gonna, there you go, see? Select, middle mouse, drag. And we're gonna go here, and you know, we're gonna brighten this up a little bit. Maybe raise the highlight, just so I know it's not Chrome, it's just viewport. If we really wanted to, we can go into Arnold, and we can, you can assign different shaders like the Arnold standard, uh, where's the, the AI standard surface. So if we select these two and we apply the standard AI, so if, let's say we select those two, right click, assign, and we double click. You can see the Arnold AI shader has different uh, properties. So it still has color, so we can still play with the color. And you see the specular is a little, it's a little more controlled. So you can play with the weight, you can play with the roughness, like how rough is an object if an object is too rough. So um, let's just close this and show you here. So if you look at the little, a swatch they give you here. So if we play with the roughness, if we turn down roughness, it basically, it's like super reflective. If we increase the roughness, it makes the object more dull and until it's just a flat shader. It, it doesn't reflect anything, okay? And then you could add a reflection color. It's just tons of little, things to play with in here, okay? And we'll be, we'll be texturing this object in Substance Painter and bringing those textures back into Maya and applying them to Arnold shaders, okay? So there you go. Let's just hit File, Increment, and Save. And we saved our object. We have our dumbbell modeled. If you really wanted to, you can probably create 3D text for the numbers, but we will leave that and do that as a displacement in Arnold. Okay. So I think I'm just gonna leave the lesson here for now. Um, I will take questions, anybody? Will you be uploading this video soon? Because I honestly stopped halfway through. So, <laughs> is that Rose? Yes. Okay. You do it totally different than both styles. So I figure I'll just watch it and figure it out. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. I have I have both videos. If you want me to upload them. Oh, I have them too. But it's okay. okay. I want to follow yours too because it's good to know different techniques. Okay. So you do a lot of things differently, so I just find I said, ah, oh, I'll just do it later and watch it. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't watched Bo's videos, uh, especially on this object, so I don't know how he does it, but this is how I would typically typically do it. So. Yeah, the one thing is, um, when you first did the sides when you were pulling to, to um, extrude it, um, normally he would probably hit the uh, Y for the mirroring, you know, within the tool, the move tool. So okay. that both sides work together so they don't have to do individual sides. You know how when you pulled it out for extruding, you pulled it out for the one side and then the other? Yeah. He actually, there's a way you can do in the tool where you can mirror it. So what you do on the right happens on the left. So that way, you, when you pull up for extruding, it actually does not both sides. So they're exactly the same. Oh, okay. So, and uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just little things. But I finally figured, oh, it's easier just to watch what you do and redo it later. Okay, no worries. Um, let me just stop the recording so the video doesn't get too long. But, uh, oops, no, that's just camera. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh,